Can you hear me in the back? Am I loud and clear? Yes, sir. I'll try and keep you awake. Um, it's a great pleasure to come back to Newport and this great institution which is now entering, as you know, its 14th decade. Um, the likes of Stephen B. Luce, Alfred Thayer Mahan, uh, William Sims, the interwar years about which Chester Nimitz said the only thing we didn't think through about World War II were the kamikaze attacks. Then other presidents such as uh, James Spruance, Stan Turner, and Medal of Honor winner Jim Stocktail. My thesis today is that history is food for thought as exercise and practice are to sports. History is to intellectual as food and as exercise and practice art of sport. Now if you were Bobby Jones and you were a natural, you didn't like to practice it, things don't, don't apply to him. But for most people, they do. And I want to talk a little about history and context before I get to my book and talk about it in three parts. First, I want to ask you uh, three questions which I don't expect you to answer. I will give three, I think, relevant historical examples and then I will get into my book, A Handful of Bullets, how the murder of Archduke Franz Ferdinand still menaces the peace, but put it in a current and contemporary setting. So those of you who are interested in history, you may be a little bit bored. And I also will try to keep Admiral Morrill awake tonight. He was at my lecture yesterday, and so I said I would entirely change it. So Denny, this is going to be entirely different. Um, to handicap myself in terms of background, I'm reminded of the story between Oliver Wendell Holmes, almost 100 years ago, who was then Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, and William Howard Taft, who was President of the United States. Now, you may not know that Taft and Holmes hated each other. You also may not remember that Taft weighed nearly 320 pounds. And one day, when the Associate Justice was meant to introduce the President, he said to his audience, an august group like yourselves, Ladies and gentlemen, I give you our pregnant president. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Taft got up slowly, ambled to the podium, turned to the audience and said, I want to let you know that Mrs. Taft and I are aware of my condition. We have decided that if it's a boy, we will call it after me. If it's a girl, we will call it after Mrs. Taft. But if, as we both suspect, it's nothing more than a bad case of gas, we will call it Oliver Wendell Holmes. <laughs> I want to ask you three questions and I don't expect you to answer, but take these home, please. First, why has America lost every war that it has started, beginning with Vietnam? How has that happened? Why did we lose Afghanistan when we shifted from going after Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden to nation building? And more importantly, why have we actually lost Iraq after 2003 invasion, which in my mind is the greatest strategic blunder in our history. You just look at conditions in the Middle East and Persian Gulf today, and they are our, largely our doing, had there not been an invasion. So think about that. Why have we lost every war we have started? Second, um, why is it that the best armies, navies, air forces, and Marine Corps in the world cannot defeat an adversary who lacks an Army, Navy, Air Force, and a Marine Corps. Why is that? Why is it that when an adversary who relies on other means that Clausewitz cited, we seem to be militarily at a loss? Think about that. And third, when you think back about the three most recent presidents of the United States, and I say this as a fierce nonpartisan. Why have we elected presidents who were not ready for the job when they took office? Realizing that the presidency is very tough and as Jack Kennedy said, there is no school for presidents. But why do we persist at least for the last 25 years to elect presidents who were not remotely ready for the job? And who take so much time to get into the job that great mistakes are made at every level? Three questions. Let me give you three examples of history which I think are important. First is Afghanistan in 2001. As you know, <clears throat> we had a rather interesting battle plan 
using the Northern Alliance, which was largely indigenous forces, to take on the Taliban. And when the Taliban were routed by a combination of special forces, B-52 and B-1 bombers, and of course the Northern Alliance, the first forces that we actually sent into the ground, on the ground, was a Marine Corps brigade headed by then Brigadier General Jim Mattis, who went on to be a four-star Central Command commander, among other things. One of the most competent division commanders the Marine Corps ever had is March to Baghdad, leading the 1st Marine Division in 2003, is a tactical masterpiece. Anyway, Jim went in, and he got there, and he said, the Marines are here, have no fear. The commander's Central, co co Central Command then was an Army four-star general named Tommy Franks. And I will say politely, Tommy Franks is the only general in history, our history, who's lost two wars. But Tommy heard this and became hugely offended because we were going after bin Laden, who is escaping to Tora Bora in the eastern part of, Pac of Afghanistan, heading to Pakistan. Now Jim, who was one of the most serious students of war and politics, his, li his personal library is over 5,000 books, knew about the Hindu Kush and Tora Bora, which was 12,000 feet above sea level. And Jim decided that the best way to go after bin Laden was to use the same plan the army used in 1876 to trap Geronimo in the high Sierra <coughs> in the southwestern part of the United States. He laid out this plan meticulously. Now what you may not know, the most competent and prepared high altitude fighting force in the world is the U.S. Marine Corps. And the reason is that during the Cold War, the Marines prepared to go to northern Norway to prepare to defend that flank against the Soviets. And in so doing, every battalion would go through Pickle Meadows in California that's some 12,000 feet above sea level. And for those of you who have never experienced altitude sickness, it's something you don't want to have, and you just can't go above 10,000 feet without training. Tommy Franks, in a bit of pique, said, no, 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 we're not going to let the Marines go in. They've had enough credit. I'm sending in the 10th Mountain Division. The 10th Mountain Division is a very, very competent force that trains at 600 feet at Fort Drum, New York. And so when they went in to high altitude, they were a disaster. Their helicopters weren't ready, and they weren't fit, and Bin Laden got away. But the point I'm making is, Mattis, with his historical background, knew he would pick on Geronimo's capture in 1876. Point one. Point two, you probably have heard about hybrid warfare. Is there anybody who hasn't heard about hybrid warfare where you combine all sorts of propaganda and everything else besides military force? All right, I'm going to give you a scenario and you can make a guess as to when this took place. It's an Eastern European country, proximate to Russia. The Russian leadership decided that it wants to take charge of this country, so it sent in little green men in uniforms, but not uniforms that were Russian. It applied a huge public relations propaganda campaign to try to scare the populace, and it decided it would attack the communications center to control all communications in this country. Now most of you are saying, aha, that's Ukraine. No, it's not. It's Estonia in 1924. And Lenin went in, and Lenin used all these tactics and was roundly defeated. And in those days, the center of communications was the telephone exchange. I make this point because there's really nothing new about hybrid warfare, except we tend to say it's new. Um, now, the last example I will use is cyber warfare. You've all heard about cyber warfare, I'm sure. If you go back to World War I, there was cyber warfare. Room 40 in the British then Ministry of War were code breakers. And one of the great rivalries between the Germans and the Central Powers and the Allies was getting control of underwater telephone and telegraph lines. So you would either pick them up and destroy them or you would intercept and monitor them. And the Germans indeed were so clever technologically in trench warfare, you all remember the uh, World War I movies. Um, trench warfare, telephone lines would be strung using wire. 
And the Germans had a technology then that did not have to tap into the wire physically, but could pick up these sound signals. Genius, cyber. And about cyber today, and you hear all the vulnerabilities, we talk about the need for a cyber Manhattan project. The Manhattan Project, as you know, built the atom bomb for World War II. But the big difference is that the Manhattan Project had a simple operational thesis. It was Einstein's E equals MC squared, which meant, boom, that is theoretically, you could generate a nuclear reaction. And so the Manhattan Project was based on a theory that would produce an outcome. The trouble with cyber is that there is no equivalent theory. So until we get that equivalent theory, cyber is going to be a jumble of dealing with symptoms, <coughs> not causes. My point is, historically, there are lots of analogies that we can use to build a basis of E equals MC squared for cyber. The first, maritime rules of the road. How long did it take to develop rules of the road so that ships did not collide in themselves, among themselves? So we need that form. Second, after, and I mentioned the Manhattan Project, 1945 and the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we were able to come up intellectually with theories on deterrence. That formed the basis for the strategy of the nuclear years. So we had the equivalence of nuclear deterrence theory is their equivalent for cyber. And most important, I would say that financial and money markets are the best equivalent because like cyber, money is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. You need it. You've got guys with guns who want to rob banks or rob you. You've got the Bernie Madoffs who are trying to con money out of you. And so the analogy between the bad side of money and cyber is very real. But my point is historically, if we want to take cyber on, there are a lot of lessons from the past. Let me then jump, having pressed three questions to you and given you three examples to talk just for a minute about my book and then I'd like to listen to your comments and questions. A handful of bullets, how the murder of Archduke Franz Ferdinand still menaces the peace, was based on the proposition that if you stepped back and just said, beyond what happened over the 70 or 80 or 90 years since the Archduke was killed, is there something we have missed? Now we all know the assassination precipitated World War I. We know that World War I was an unfinished war. It was not the war to end all wars, as President Wilson said. It put in place the seeds for World War II. And even though World War II was a decisive victory for the Allies, including the Soviet Union, it put in place the basis for the Cold War. But was there anything else? And I argue that because of various forces, particularly the diffusion or spread of power, economic power, social power, military power, and because of globalization, the interconnectivity and interdependence of people around the world. You pick up your cell phone, you can call somebody in Botswana, China, anywhere if you wanted to. And vice versa, people who lived in what could be called primitive third or fourth world countries because of this thing called a dish and satellites have absolute access. And so because of those factors, I argue what is missed is that four new horsemen of the apocalypse have been created. And they have been created in part because the empowerment in, in some measure due to the information and communications revolution, the internet, has empowered not only states, look at the rise, if you will, of China and other countries, but so-called non-state actors, which is a horrible term, to include Al-Qaeda, to include the Islamic State and other terrorist groups, and individuals. Think about Edward Snowden and what he did by revealing all that information about the National Security Agency, or Julian Assange and WikiLinks, and how individuals now have been empowered. Now it's true, on June 28th, Gavrilo Princip, a Serbian nutcase, was sitting in a cafe and with three bullets was able to start World War II. Yeah, World War I. Sure, there are individual instances like that. My point is now, instead of there being one Archduke and one assassin, when you think around the world of all the potential explosive places, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Syria, 
all those places, Africa, you now have almost an infinite number of potential archdukes and you got a lot of potential assassins. And by the way, you don't have to fire a bullet at an archduke directly to get a kill. A hopeless Tunisian fruit vendor four years ago lit himself a fire and caused the Arab awakening. Absolutely unconnected and boom, in Tunisia this thing spreads and we have the Arab awakening. So those are some of the differences that have arisen to help create the four horsemen. Now the first of the four horsemen is failed and failing government. We have failed and failing government Afghanistan to Zimbabwe with Washington and Brussels in between. And I'm sure those of you who look to Washington shake your heads and wonder how this country has got to a point where both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue are not only constipated, but the only way they look at each other is through the lenses of extreme partisanship and the most vituperative politics we have ever seen. And it's not unique to the United States. Second, economic despair, disparity, and dislocation. The United States has not recovered from the 2008 financial crisis. Our real unemployment, if you include people who are only working part-time or given up, is probably closer to 15% than 5%. But the United States is not unique. Almost anywhere around the world you look, Greece, Afghanistan, Iraq, the economics and economic despair and economic dislocation and disparity are forces that really create a lot of people who are removed from the political process and that in turn builds great deals of resentment as you can understand. One of the biggest problems that President Xi Jinping in China faces that he has an underclass of three or four hundred million people out of a population of 1.3 or 1.4 billion. That underclass is bigger than the population of the United States. How do you deal with that? Because they've got their cell phones, they have their television discs, they can watch everything, and yet unless their standard of living goes up, Xi has got to deal with a problem that every single Chinese emperor, member of the Communist Party had it dealt with, peasant uprising going back 5,000 years. And intensifying all this is the issue of religious violent extremism. And of course we've seen this since September 11th. Let me go back in history. When Lenin took over Russia in 1917, he used communism, Marxism, Leninism, as the legitimizing theory to mobilize the public. He was a political activist of the first order and he used the ideology to help him take power and to continue power. It was an end rather than a means. When Hitler, who took office legally in Germany in 1933, did so with Nazism, it was an ideology around which he could mobilize the party. Well what's happened with Al-Qaeda and now the Islamic State they are using the most perverted form of Islam as a mobilizing factor, as a recruiting factor, as a legitimizing factor in which they are bringing together people who see this as a vision and a way that they can either retaliate against things that have been done to them or in the hopes, optimistically and even madly, madly in the, same, in the way of being insane, that they can achieve their ends. We're dealing with that. And finally, I will not go into great detail except to say that the fourth horseman is environmental catastrophe. People are having a huge drought and can't get water in California and people are drowning in Texas. We have earthquakes, storms, the most bizarre weather patterns, let alone climate change. And on top of that, we have little things called Ebola and other diseases that can be rapidly communicated around the world. And so we have to be very, very concerned about the whole impact of environment catastrophe. Now in my book, I go into chapter and verse about how we deal with broken government in the United States, how we repair it, how we deal with economic despair and disparity, how we take on the issue of violent ideological extremism, and to a lesser degree the issue about the environment. 
Let me just focus because I'm sure you're all very, very well read and have your own views about the broken American government on two areas before I stop and let you ask questions. What do we do about the economy and what do we do about violent extremism? <coughs> I have argued, I thought I lived in a fourth world city in Washington, D.C. We live in Georgetown on N Street. Right behind us is a pothole. If you jump into, you can go to China. <laughs> We, my wife and I were in New York. I was talking at the Harvard Club two nights ago. The roads are even worse in New York City than they are in Washington. And we were driving up here in 95. Uh, I needed a tank and not a sports car. So our infrastructure is falling apart. We have fracking, and you know fracking produces natural gas, right? Big deal. How do you get natural gas out of the country? You're not going to fly it out. You're not going to drive it out. Ships, right? How many ports do we have that are capable of handling these large supercarriers? You bet. Uno. One. The electrical power grid in 1982 in a study done by an, a, a think tank I used to be associated with, Center for Strategic International Studies, said the most, this is 1982, more than 30 years ago, biggest vulnerability in the United States today is our electrical power grid because it's so vulnerable. And guess what? It's even more vulnerable. So my view is, we need a national infrastructure bank. Now, how are you going to pay for it? Our national debt is $20 trillion. You don't want the government getting into more debt. The way I would do it is to say to corporations which have over a trillion dollars in cash, real money, overseas because of tax issues, to say you can repatriate that money here. <coughs> we'll give you a tax break if you invest it in these infrastructure <coughs> projects. And similarly, we will sell the equivalent of war bonds to the public. So we could probably raise, say, two trillion dollars. We do it over 30 years. We would pay interest rates 2% above prime, so you'd make more money than if you invested it in the bank where you get virtually zero. And it would be paid for by user fees, tolls, and other charges that would come from improving the infrastructure. And this could be as varied as you want to include education, the internet, but what we need to do is to put the United States in a position where we are prepared to compete in the 21st century. Because otherwise, your grandchildren and great-grandchildren are going to be at a huge disadvantage. The last point I would make about dealing with violent religious extremism, most of you have probably heard about code breaking, Ultra and Enigma during World War II. One of the best sources for doing that was called Bletchley Park in England. And you may have seen the movie about Alan Turing that came out about four or five months ago, where all the code breakers were in Bletchley and they were able to break the German codes and the Japanese codes. We need the equivalent of that for dealing with the Islamic State and these terrorist groups. Now, unlike the Cold War, where we spent hundreds of billions of dollars on satellites and so-called national technical means, today, Penetration can be done entirely using social media. It's fascinating. Looking at YouTube, where selfies have been posted, Twitter, all these other social media accounts. And to give you an example, at the Atlantic Council, three fairly junior members of the staff and ten unpaid interns were able to prove without a doubt that there were Russian troops in Ukraine. Now those of you who had seen the movie Casablanca, Claude Rains, uh, will say, yep, gambling at Rick's, I'm shocked. There are Russian troops in Ukraine, of course. How do you prove it? And one way they proved it, which is fascinating, they traced a young Russian paratrooper who was in Siberia 3,000 miles west to Ukraine. And they fixed him in Siberia because of a selfie he posted on the internet. And they traced him all the way into Ukraine where he was picked up on a video that some Ukrainian had been, had been using. And with voice and, and, and facial recognition, you can do that. Now, if you take that to an extreme, instead of using all these very, very, very expensive national technical systems, we have a means of being able to penetrate to understand the why and the how of these groups. It's something we need to do. And so if you take anything away from this talk, we have huge opportunities here. We have huge problems. 
the four horsemen I talked about, broken government, economic despair, ideological nutcases, and environmental catastrophe. We can deal with those. But it's going to take the public, you and hundreds of millions of other Americans, to get themselves engaged. Because unless or until we demand the government that's going to suit our needs, we will not get that government. And if we do not impose any kind of pressure on the government, we will also get that form of government. And that's not going to make life any better for any of us. Thank you very much, and I would be delighted to answer your questions. You mentioned several solutions and your four horsemen. Yeah. Um, the, the underlying issue of these solutions, and you <coughs> the first horseman, the government, right. uh, has to do with management and leadership. Right. I mean, how do you get something started to fix the grid, for example? And how do you follow through to be sure the money is spent where it's supposed to be spent? And how do you hold accountable those who don't follow through and, and do it properly? And how do, you, how do you assure the outcome? One of the biggest problems, I talk about failed government we have, uh, is that we may be at a situation where our political system invented by the best minds of the 18th century of checks and balances no longer works. You've got divided government. You've got a problem in the Congress where you need virtually everybody to say yes. And if one person says no, Rand Paul, in the debate over the NSA law, things don't work. Uh, this is going to take time to overcome. I argue for universal voting. That is to say, every eligible citizen has got to go to the polls. They don't have to vote, but they've got to show up. And the reason I think that will be important over time it is going to force more Americans to become engaged in their government. It's also going to factor out money, because you just don't have enough money to try to influence that. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's also going to force more of our politicians to run from the center, rather than from the extreme left or the extreme right, which they have to do in the primaries. Look at poor um, Romney. Mitt Romney had to stand on a stage with a bunch of idiots and was embarrassed by it and had to run to the right to get the nomination and by the time the election came, he was dead meat. I mean, all the Democrats really had to do was to show, you know, those spectacles with Maureen Bachman and, and Herman Cain and all those other lightweights there. And I say this as a nonpartisan. Um, and I think public engagement is going to be the only way. You also have among the younger generation a failure of people to become interested in government. My, none of my, my wife's children or my brother's children <coughs> have any interest in going to government. You know, it's painful. So I think universal voting is a way that you could attract people back into government. We also have to have a revision of our National Security Act of 1947. You know, it's 70 years old and quite frankly it was written at a time even though it's been amended, when the world was different. We've got to do that. Uh, this is not going to happen overnight. If you take a look at the candidates who are running on both tickets right now, uh, none of them, in my mind, has the experience of the requisite skills to be president, with one exception, and I don't think he's going to make it. That's John Kasich of Ohio. Interestingly, if you want to be president, you've got to win in Ohio. And I admit in my book with tongue in cheek, that maybe we ought to have just the election in Ohio determine everything and the 49 other states can not spend all the kind of money. But the issue is, can we make our political system work? And I would argue the only way is to get the public re-engaged. That's the issue. It's going to take a lot of leadership, but quite frankly it's going to take Americans just to say, we are fed up. We've had enough of this nonsense. We have got to do something. And whether that will catch fire as it did in 1775, I don't know. Now, if it doesn't, I don't have an apocalyptic view of the world. I don't believe the barbarians are at the gate. No matter how bad things get in the Middle East and they will get worse, I think we are somewhat insulated. But what will happen will be our national standard of living will decline and may decline precipitously. And the expectations of the American dream will not be met. Now, at some stage in the future, whenever that is, 10 years, 100 years, I don't know, the consequences could be very, 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 very great, as in 1775. Remember the best line in the Declaration of Independence that Tom Jefferson wrote, 
When government becomes destructive, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and establish a new one. And we did. We got rid of George. So there is something in our roots. But your question gets to the heart of democracy and the future of the United States. And it is by no means clear whether our system is self-writing. It may take a huge crisis. Remember, the country was in worse depression in 38 and 39 than it was in 29. And it was really World War II that enabled us to recover from the depression and become an economic superpower. That's a long-winded question to uh, answer to a very good question, but it is the question. Thank you. Please. We're supposed to have the best military in the world, which we do, or used to, and during the Civil War, President Lincoln called Grant in after three years of right. war, and he says, I've tried to run the war, and I can't do it, win it. So Grant did. So my question is, we don't have people of that caliber uh, in politics. So we've got to get rid of the lot of the dead wood. Um, <laughs> the political system, that was probably the greatest existential crisis in our history in 1861. And of course the world was a lot different then. And it wasn't Grant alone who won the war. The fact that we won the war, I should say the North won, was because there's no way the, uh, the uh, feudal South could ever take on the economic industry of the North. I mean, it was almost foreordained, despite Grant and guys like Sherman and others. Um, I go back to this issue that presidents are just not experienced enough when they take office. The last president in my mind that was experienced and as ready for the job as possible was George H.W. Bush. When his son came in, Bill Clinton came in and Bill Clinton is the luckiest man in the world. We just won Desert Storm in 91. The economy because of H.W. Bush was turning around and guess what? The Soviet Union had collapsed. So he's sitting in a poker game and he just got a royal straight flush. Brilliant. Bush comes in September 11th and for the wrong reasons because he thought he could really fix the geostrategic landscape of the Middle East we go into Iraq and I think had there been no weapons of mass destruction we still would have gone in because people would have argued you can't trust Saddam Hussein. It's inexperience, lack of judgment. And then Obama comes in and unlike Clinton Obama had been dealt the worst hand of any president since FDR. Because look, he's got a financial crisis before the election. Iraq has gone to hell in a handbasket. Afghanistan is going south quickly. And he makes these huge mistakes. So the only way around that is if you can get a president who's got the right skill set to have the maturity and the judgment to deal with that. But it's extremely difficult because politics in the United States now are no longer about governing. They're about getting elected and reelected. And in doing that, you do that by virtue of negative campaigning, positive campaigning, you want to really destroy the adversary. So until we get people who are prepared to be more serious about national security and not focus on sound bites um, and slogans rather than understanding, we're not going to be able to deal very, very, very successfully with that. And so I don't have a very, very good answer to your question as I said, I think in the field, Kasich is probably the only one that might make, have the makings. Of course, somebody could be surprising like Harry Truman. Nobody thought Truman would be a great president, and he was. Um, but I think that candidates should be made to read the Constitution. And Article 2 of the Constitution says, executive power shall be vested in the president. When we talk about the president as commander-in-chief. That's a lesser included authority. It's executive power. And so you think you'd want to get a good executive, and if I were running the debates, that would be my first, second, and third question. Ve executive power is going to be vested in you. How do you intend to use it? So I think part of the right answer is asking the tough questions, but we'll see. Please. How do, how do you see the involvement of personal and public media now that there's almost instantaneous ability to arouse people, and I see it increasing protests, ah, armed protest now being at I mean, it's a... Um, 
clearly there has been a revolution in social media. Uh, I'll give you an example. The BBC in England interviewed 15 kids, 10 and under, 12, and asking which is more important, your cell phone or your television set. Guess what they all said? Cell, cell phone. phone, of course, of course. But the point is, the social media cuts both ways. And so administrations can you, and, they, and this particular White House has been using social media much more than others, but you need a message that resonates. And the problem is we do not have a good message that resonates. This goes across administrations. We're getting killed, in the, for example, in the propaganda war in Ukraine. Putin is beating us seven ways from Sunday. The Islamic State is beating us seven ways from Sunday. Why is that? I go back to my suggestion for a Bletchley Park. And so, yeah, obviously communications are different. Uh, kids today will not have the social skills of your generation, my generation, other generations. Because why? They all are going multitasking. They're on their computer. They're on their cell phone. And they've got networks of friends on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But no face-to-face -face contact. It's all done through the ether and by electrons. The point is we have to understand about how to use these tools in government much better. And that's going to require thought. I go back to cyber. Where is the E equals MC squared equivalent for cyber? And so if we get the foundations right, then we can make progress. But the government, unfortunately, has been very ineffective in being able to do that. There's a hand in the back. Please. Yeah, um, you mentioned the phrase universal voting. Yeah. I know what the words mean, but I don't understand how that would apply to voting. <laughs> and how you get people to vote. Um, it's, it's mandatory. Uh, in countries like... I understand that, but how do you enforce... I mean, it's like you're creating... Um, and how does that affect... How do you envision that that could uh, help start the process? Well, Australia, Australia, Switzerland, and Brazil, among others, have mandatory voting. Um, I assume most of you pay taxes, have real estate taxes, you have driver's licenses, right? That's mandatory. And if you want to practice law, practice medicine, fly an airplane, you've got to get a license. And so we have in government the capacity to be able to license people to do things. You put together a network on the state and local level, this is not going to require any kind of federal law to change things, in which people are mandated and you have the way of identifying people because they're, they either have some residence, they either are paying some taxes, they've got phone bills, so forth and so on, where you have a pretty good handle of who people are and you've got to follow up on all that. We still have registration for, social, for, uh, for the draft, for selective service. So this is not going to be a Herculean problem. And even if you only get 90% of the population under those circumstances and you get a super majority of those people to vote, that would still be 70 or 80 percent as opposed to the 50 plus percent. So I'm not worried about how you organize or get people to do it. And you can, if you fail to vote or show up, because you don't have to vote, you just have to show up and presumably people will show up and vote, then you can either have fines or more importantly, you then have people have to do public service. So if you fail to vote, you have to commit 50 or 100 hours of public service. And part of that sub-public service could be reading history books and civics books <laughs> to get you better educated. So, I mean, I, this is not a Herculean problem, but the issue is entirely political. Can we get a political system to face up to this? Because Republicans and Democrats are going to say, hell no, that means other people might be elected. So getting the political system to move is critical. But if we don't do it, and we still have a relatively small majority of Americans who are eligible voting, we're going to continue to get the same kind of government we have. And that's just not working in my judgment. So how do you change that without changing the Constitution dramatically? Yeah? Would you consider the, uh, in Obama's success a normalization of relations with Cuba? Oh, yeah. I mean, this had been done 40 years ago. I think we just were stupid, quite frankly. Do you think he's had a string of successes? Or do you think he's made... You, you said he had <laughs> mistakes to begin with. It, it's, it's tragic. Um, Jim Jones was national security advisor. Jim Jones and I have been close forever. Um, I've been on, I was on Jim's advisory board when Jim was commandant and I was on the Allied, Supreme Allied Commander's job. Um, 
Obama came in, he was inexperienced. The first thing he did was have an Afghan Pakistan study, had 11 basic assumptions, each one was flawed. Um, and, and the trouble is that, in my judgment, Obama is a very, very smart, academic, very cautious guy who believes that if you do too much, you're going to get into trouble. And so he thinks, I believe, that the way to deal is to take a de minimis position. That is to do the least that you have to do. And so as a result, the Afghan-Pakistan issue and the withdrawal and the way it was done was obscenely bad. In Iraq, he didn't have a chance, a choice, because Bush could not negotiate a status of forces agreement. And so we were forced to leave Iraq under those circumstances. And even though the Republicans want to blame Obama, um, that was the issue. And unfortunately, we were stuck with Maliki, the then prime minister, who was a villain, a villain. And so I'm afraid that Iraq was not self-healing. There was little that I think Obama could have done at the time. Now, having said that, he has been enormously reluctant to re-engage in Iraq and the region. March a year ago, 2014, uh, I was able to influence John Kerry, Secretary of State, for whom I have the highest regard, to get General John Allen, retired Marine, into the White House to meet with Obama about what was happening in Iraq. The situation then got worse in June of last year. You will remember that Mosul fell to the Islamic State. Only in September did Obama then agree to form a coalition to take on the Islamic State. He called it the Junior Varsity. And we have been very slow in rallying that coalition. Now it's very difficult because Iraq is a mess. It's basically been divided up, not de facto, but uh, actually de facto into three different parts. Uh, the Sunni Shia problem is huge and it's not getting any better. But as I have argued, we could have done a lot better. And Obama, in my mind, has failed. So Cuba, yeah, it's, over, it's long overdue, but you know, this is an elephant and chicken stew. I mean, I think it was important that we normalize with Cuba, but that's the chicken. And the elephant is Iraq, Syria, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Now, if the talks with Iran work and we get a verifiable, credible agreement to limit their nuclear aspirations, that could be a huge success. That could be a game changer. And I don't know whether Kerry's broken leg is going to impede that. He's optimistic <laughs> right now and thinks he's going to be able to get back. And I don't know how serious the surgery was. I will find out shortly. But if we do get that agreement, and the Republicans and the Israelis are going to go ballistic no matter what happens, that could be a very, very positive impact. And if we build on that, that might be enough leverage to be able to contain what's going on in Iraq and Syria. But I'm enormously critical of this administration and this president. Unlike George W. Bush, who I think by the end of his second term was a very, very good president, even though he had been disastrous in the beginning, I don't think Obama has learned. And so I'm very pessimistic that unless Kerry can pull off a small miracle, um, we're not going to see any really great things emerge from this administration. Uh, sorry, there's a hand way in the back. Uh, sir, I just wanted to ask you if you think we're witnessing the end of the Sykes and Pico agreement. Oh, it's finished. Yeah. For those of you who don't remember, 1916, Sykes and Pico, a British and French diplomat, redefined the Middle East, cutting up, forming, you know, what's, what the current Middle East looks like over artificial, when it was all entirely tribal, and that has been one of the problems. sykes Pico is finito. So do you think it's feasible that we're able to sustain these borders? No. Yeah. No. We can't, and they never really were, but the pressure uh, is such. And <clears throat> unfortunately, this will sound harsh, but if in Syria we were going to use the, as a single metric human life, if we wanted to mis minimize the loss of life, because there have been nearly 300,000 Syrians killed, we should have supported Assad, as brutal as that sounded. Because fewer people would have been killed, even though if you're on the other side, living under Assad is like living, was like living under Saddam Hussein. But the Islamic State would be a lot lesser of a threat. And for political reasons, 
we couldn't do it. And so we're stuck with this mess. And uh, I don't, as I said, I don't have much confidence that this administration, this White House, I should say, because Kerry is capable, but he's not president, sadly, doesn't know how to work all these different moving parts. And I don't think it will. You had a... Yes. <clears throat> what is your opinion of the unions in federal employment? <clears throat> I don't really have a strong view, quite frankly. I, I'm not really competent. I haven't looked at it enough. I don't have any real problems with them. The reason I ask is the attitude in many of these bureaucracies will not change. <clears throat> it's stagnant. And uh, you can't fire them. Uh, well, that's not unions. That you, you're talking about the civil service regulations, which are, which are something different. Are unionized, no, not really. Some of them are, but not all of them. But look, the problem is we've got a, we have a government that was designed based on a 20th century model. Mm -hmm. And we've got, you know, we've got all these redundant cabinet positions. I mean, if I were president, I would probably go down to three or four or five cabinet positions. You know, this monstrosity called the Department of Homeland Security, you know, 16 in agencies, they don't know what they're doing. And, and should that be a surprise? Because you just don't have, look, any, I'm not suggesting that what happens in the private sector is perfect and always, and always, always applies. But you take a look at any of the big Fortune 50 companies. Do they have a headquarters staff money in the tens of thousands? Of course not. Why? Because you've got to decentralize and you've got to assign responsibility. And the problem with our system of government is that every White House wants to avert a political re relations disaster. I mean, here you got the Department of Defense shipping live anthrax. Oh my God, it's the end of the world. So what happens is that all power matriculates to the White House. They're in charge. Cabinet secretaries are relatively powerless. And so you have a government that is just paralyzed by all this. And so you've got to change that. You've got to give the cabinet secretaries the authority to run their department. And the president has got to be, as I said, the executive. And yet the system has been moving into a direction where that has become impossible. And that's why government, certainly on the executive side, is broken. And then you get on the congressional side, it's equally broken. And so uh, as uh, Samuel Johnson, that great English writer of several hundred years ago, said, it's not uh, that a dog walks on its hind legs badly. It's that it walks at all on its hind legs. And it's amazing that our government manages to function, or doesn't, in its current condition and can do the minimum that it's doing. Well, you overfund too many of these departments. Uh, the government does. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, that's Scrooge talking about. <laughs> Not really. Uh, you mentioned uh, the coalition in the Middle East. Right. Does it exist? Yeah. Yeah, they're meeting, they were meeting the other day in Paris. It's 62 well, countries. That, but I mean, does it there do six, anything? Well, here's, here's the other question. Let me just, if you don't understand, the coalition is 62 like-minded states, 28 of whom come from NATO. You've got the six Gulf cooperative countries, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, UAE, uh, Oman, Bahrain, who did I forget? Gutter. Gutter, thank you, Denny. And then you've got Egypt, Jordan, uh, Turkey, well, Turkey's part of NATO, part of this. The problem is, when you take a look at what's happening in the Middle East and the coalition, who is in charge in the White House? Please tell me, because I don't know, of this operation. Please tell me the command structure. Please tell me how Central Command in Tampa, Special Forces Command in Tampa, European Command in Stuttgart, Germany, and AFRICOM in Stuttgart, Germany, Africa Command, relate and tell me how the coalition has been assigned certain responsibilities. What is Turkey doing? Boom, 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 boom. John Allen, who's our special envoy, is pulling his hair out because we haven't been able to take a strain and get this going. Now we've had nine months, ten months of the coalition. Ten months, ten months after Pearl Harbor, after December 7, 1941, we were winning the war. We mobilized the country. We had won at Midway, we had won at Stalingrad, and the Axis powers were in retreat. In 10 months, 10 months we've been in the Middle East and we haven't accomplished anything. I, you know, I despair sometimes. Anything else?
Which horse are you betting on? <laughs> American Pharaoh in the Belmont. I'm not, I'm not betting. I'm, I'm non-political. I will provide advice to anybody. As I said... On horses? <laughs> that's probably a better bet. Um, I'm just not enthralled by anybody on either side. Maybe, maybe Kasich. Uh, Pataki, who's got a lot of executive experience, frightens me on foreign policy. Jeb Bush made a speech in Chicago on foreign policy that I found to be really not good. And the fact that he's got a lot of retreads from his brother's administration does not sit well. Uh, I'm not a great Hillary fan because even though I think she's very bright, very, very competent, and she's good at being Hillary, I don't think that she's got the judgment to be a good president. Bernie Sanders is uh, almost my age, and that's too old to do anything. Um, <laughs> and Martin O'Malley is not going to get is not going to get over Baltimore, and is not serious. And uh, uh, Chafee is a good guy. I knew Chafee when he was a senator. I knew his father as well. I don't think he's going to be a serious contender. So on the Republican side, uh, if he had a better voice. Maybe Rick Perry could make a resurrection, but I'm just not, you know, the only two guys that I think would be good presidents are John Kerry and Colin Powell, and neither is going to run, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Sorry, lady in the back? Yeah, just have, I just, I'm curious about your ideas on this. Citizens United, I mean, they, you right. mentioned them as one of your horsemen of the apocalypse, but um, I might suggest that it's the fifth runner. Citizens United is a runner. Everybody knows Citizens United. Money is free speech. Yeah. Money is free speech. Yeah. Money is free speech. Yeah. 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 Yeah.